Well, hi guys. Hello, this is Christopher. And Angela. And what are we? We are the Dinosaur Omelette. Hi guys, uh, thanks for coming in. So I had this one scheduled for uh, for a while. I wanted to do a Quail 101 intro course. So we're going to be going over what? How to... How to keep them, how to raise them, common questions. Yeah, startup questions. So the objective today with this video is for you new guys, especially all you TikTokers and uh, people who aren't familiar with these birds, I want to get you a base understanding of uh, these quail, how to keep them, and how to have a successful egg program. Can you maybe zoom in video? I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. well, maybe later. Anyway, mm -hmm. move. So we're going to go over like all the basics. First of all, um, if you guys are watching this, you have any questions, Put them in the comments. We like to get yeah. questions because this is kind of education. And the good thing about the internet, it's the year 2000. We can do interactive stuff here. So you can uh, ask questions and use our knowledge. Mm -hmm. I talk a lot. So, um, house cleaning. They call it house cleaning. I, I don't. I keep the house clean. So, <laughs> so uh, some issues that I've been getting a lot of questions with before we begin. Mm -hmm. These are just general questions about the quail and the eggs. So if you're curious, I'm going to shoot these out real quick before we get started. So what do the eggs taste like, if you guys are new? And you're wondering, should I even invest in these quails? Do the eggs taste funny? The eggs taste like, what do you call it? Chicken eggs. They taste, what do you say? They're very similar? Yeah, yeah. They're very similar. They're very similar in flavor. The texture is, I would say, meatier. It's, I don't know. That's bad descriptive. There's, <laughs> it's a richer egg because there's a higher yolk to white ratio. Mm -hmm. So the yolk is gonna be a little more, like if you shrunk a chicken egg down to the size of a quail egg, that yolk in the chicken egg would be a lot bigger. Does that make sense? Yeah, there would be less white um, in comparison to the yolk. Yeah. yeah, but they're very, they're, they're tasty. I like them, I cook them in anything. I mean, you're not gonna tell the difference. In fact, uh, somebody had asked about the whole egg taste issue. I said, mm -hmm. well, yeah, before you go ahead and invest in the quail just order a pack of eggs go down to the grocery some of these ethnic grocers will carry quail eggs you know and just taste them mm -hmm. and you'll discover they taste like chicken eggs but the ones you make at home are going to be a little healthier mm -hmm. and if you're feeding them you know your regular feed then eggs taste normal but of course just like chickens if you're feeding your chickens onions or something spicy that flavor will transfer through yeah a uh, young feller asked today my, uh, I, t I had quail eggs once and they tasted funny. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I wasn't there, so I couldn't say, but there's a lot of causes for uh, a flavor in an egg to change. The Like she said, you could add an ingredient, um, sulfur compounds like in the onions and garlic, you definitely mm -hmm. gonna taste them, so. Yeah, some people like to, you know, feed scraps, so yeah, something so to think about. <laughs> if you like having onion in your eggs and your omelet, feed your chickens onions, you'll never tell. Anyway, so. We got that away. They taste like chicken eggs. How big are they? They're about one third the size of a chicken egg. So three of these, three quail eggs, equal about one chicken egg, maybe a little more. I mean, these are jumbo quail, so the eggs are a little bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, so eggs, how are they loud? The other question we received is, are they loud? Oh, new people dropping in. I started at the beginning to say this. <laughs> what should they do? Ask. Yeah, ask any questions if you have them um, during the entire time. Just post any questions and we'll we'll talk about it. Yeah, just put question in the vid if you have anything to mm -hmm. ask us. So um, we did taste, number of chicken eggs. Are they loud? No. These are, they're very quiet, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you. You're not going to notice them really. Bo both males and females, actually, they make sounds that seem like crickets. They sound like crickets. Um, and males, they when they make their little. Um, chattery crow sound it really it sounds like a wild bird they so if you have can you imitate it for us no I can't ha, ha, ha. Yeah. it's called a Coturnix quail because it's supposed to mimic the sound they make Coturnix like a Bob White goes Bob White Bob White so the Coturnix is supposed to make a Coturnix noise uh, so I've heard it parlayed into an explanation <laughs> yeah. but it's a very short like she said yeah. wild bird call but yeah so it's your neighbors wouldn't know what they are. They would assume that it's just a wild bird. And the males are relatively quiet. If you have um, proper ratio, um, the proper ratio of males to females, if you have a pen that's full of bachelors, then, and they have nothing to do, 
um, no females to entertain themselves, then they'll hey, be a little more chattery. That's Hello. Hey, uh, it looks like there's a there's a comment sure. there. Who was our nice neighbor saying she could hear them chattering like raccoons? Yeah, they do sound oh, like yeah. raccoons. Yeah, raccoons. Yeah. So yeah, they don't make too much noise. Like the ratio she's talking about is to d uh, diminish territoriality, mm -hmm. aggressiveness between the birds, and you know, like two dudes hanging out. Like there's a bunch of chicks in there. Like they're gonna get loud competing against each other. Yeah, better like, proper ratio than the males are the quail doing their thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the ratio is good if it's like five females to one rooster is what we keep. Mm -hmm. They're very minimal in sound, and you're not going to notice them. Mm -hmm. So and that's not a lie. You can talk to these people who breed them. It's if you have a million males, they're going to compete, but otherwise they're quiet. So uh, can you keep them in a room? Uh, yes, you can keep like them in a room. Doors. Like so, all birds. They produce a dust, a feather dust, as they continue to grow. My male started crowing this week. It's kind of adorable. I know. It's such a unique sound. Yeah. So, yeah. They're Sorry. really neat. You guys maybe don't see, but we have comments come up. So when we start staring like this, we're reading. <laughs> and we're reading off a phone. So. Yeah. Our uh, recording studio is a cell phone. <laughs> Very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So what the hell was I talking Indoors. About? Oh, yeah. yeah indoors. indoors. Yes, you can raise them indoors, but do be aware they produce a fine dust as the feathers grow out. Just like, you know, when you're going around a house and you notice human skin cells, right? That's what most dust is. Well, the birds produce dust too as they begin to feather out. And the more birds you have, the more dust you have. So I would keep the number, if you're raising them in a house, like you have a room, a spare room, or you're keeping yeah, or them as pets. Yeah, if you're in an apartment. Four, five, maybe six. Yeah, like a breeding set. Um, if you want to be able to hatch them, then that would be one male, five females, or you could just have females. Yeah, six you should be able to manage indoors mm -hmm. without smell and without sound and without a lot of dust. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it yeah, depends again on the, lack, the, the circulation, mm -hmm. ventilation, and size of the room. Yeah, we wouldn't encourage a large number. Yeah, I mean, you can raise them in a garage. People do raise yeah, so you can, a, a bunch in a garage. I'll put a fan in. Just good ventilation. If you're going to raise them in a garage, you're still going to have dust, so you're going to want to put a, uh, a ventilation system, mm -hmm. something to suck out that dust. Yeah. Okay, because they'll produce dust. Otherwise, just keep them outside. Uh, okay, um, anything else important that I've been getting questions about? Yeah. How long to incubate? About two weeks, 17 days? Yeah, the technical number is 18 days. So if you're incubating, um, I, I like to do the... Um, when you put them in the incubator, that's day zero, and then you count zero, one, two, three. So then day 14, you put them on lockdown, which is you stop turning them, you increase your humidity, and pre they're preparing for hatching. And then they'll start, if everything is regulated properly, they'll start, a couple will hatch on day 16, most of them will hatch on 17, day 17, and then they'll finish up on day 18, maybe 19. Yeah, and if you want to hatch, we're going to do a YouTube video about that. Like, this format's good for interacting to get to you guys doing these live videos, but we're going to do like a more um, succinct hatching video mm -hmm. and quail videos on that YouTube channel. Oh, by the way, we just start a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Go go, go over there and look at I only have two videos today, yeah. but I'll add some we'll more. We'll add more. By the way, what we're talking about, it's kind of a bad depiction, this is all I have, Jumbo Caternix. We raise Jumbo Caternix. There are a lot of quail, and what's the benefit of the big? So, yeah, just to um, be more specific, if anybody's looking around for hatching eggs from different breeders or such, um, you might be wondering what what names do they go by? Christopher just said Jumbo Caternix quail. Um, specifically, for the brown ones, there's... Um, people are working on different varieties, but the well-known ones are the brown ones or the white ones. The brown ones are nice because they're feather sexable. We'll show you an example of that, but you can tell at three weeks old, you can tell who's a boy and who's a girl. The whites, you can't sex them from feather. You have to vent sex them when they're um, six weeks old or maturing. Um, so the jumbo um, browns that we use, we, you can call them, they're known as jumbo wild or Jumbo Faro, Jumbo Brown, Jumbo Meat Maker. Japanese, Japonica. Um, those are just different. Uh, they're all like the same bird, but depending on the breeder and their specific line, mm -hmm. they have their own name. But it means the same type, which is big, meaty bird that lays the largest eggs in the quail world. Yeah, I put it in regular people parlance. You see, where I come from, we eat subs. 
And over here, they eat hoagies? Mm -hmm. Is that it? What the hell yeah, is a hoagie? Yeah, there are oh. breeders that are proud. Rose by their, any other name. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But if you're looking and you're searching online, just to kind of give you an idea, they're, they're, they're the same uh, product that you're getting as far as meaty bird and big big eggs. Yeah, and uh, I guess we're going to show you the birds and get into the whole quail 101 thing to teach you about mm -hmm. how to set up for that. So again, like our objective here with you guys is we're dealing with a lot of new homesteaders and uh, people who split out of the cities and just bought new places. And it's, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. So we stuffed all this <laughs> info into our brains and we are going to give it to you for free because we like humans and not nuts. <laughs> so we want you guys to do well and raise, raise critters, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we serve a local area. We're getting a lot of questions too. I should have put that on here. Can we buy quails from you? Uh, we do we do sell quail, but we're a local to Southern Lancaster County. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to Pennsylvania. Yeah, we don't want to ship the birds because it's dangerous for them. They especially these smaller quail and the chicks. Yeah, the the jumbo quail in general, they have a faster metabolism throughout their entire lifespan. So they do need to have food and water available available to them at all times. And the chicks um yes just like chicken chicks they have that yolk in them and they that they should be able to travel through the whole shipping process but they're just so small and delicate and then uh, when people receive them people do there are companies who do ship chicks but sometimes when people receive them uh, they're just like dehydrated and like starving and, and that's not good for them you growth. get high fatality immediately and yeah. it's really disheartening for everyone <laughs> yeah, well so, it shocks our system because they're they metabolize and they grow so quickly even yeah, at one day I mean, that one day of shipping mm -hmm. can have a detriment to their as adult. soon as I take them out of the incubator they're eating like they're looking for the food and they're eating and then they take their little cute baby naps mm -hmm. and then they're eating again and there are um, companies who will give um, supplemental type of gel or different types of food in the shipping boxes but they're just so delicate and tiny uh, we just recommend if you're gonna do shipping order hatching eggs and like Christopher was saying we serve our local area and at this time it's the busy season now we're into the busy season so we're mm -hmm. hatching everything we can to um, supply to our local market with chicks. So we don't yeah. have our hatching eggs available. Yeah, it would at be this, at this it would be busy <laughs> normally, but now you have all this egg stuff going on and people are flipping out and they're like, screw this, we're gonna make our own eggs at home. And uh, I'm telling you, these, these quail are really, really awesome in comparison to, I mean, we have chickens and I'm like, I'm not bad mouthing chickens, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but these things are really fantastic for anybody who wants to have a food program. I mean, you can literally have food and eggs, I mean, eggs and meat rotating mm -hmm. in a small hutch in a little mm -hmm. box. These birds just grow quick. They're, mm -hmm. they're not popular in the U.S. as chickens because this is chicken culture. That's a multi-billion dollar industry. These things require a whole new kind of infrastructure. They're very popular overseas. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it's just the same concept with milk in the United States. Um, cattle, ca dairy cows are popular, but everywhere else it's goats, goat milk. So it's kind of the same milk. concept, really cultural thing, milk. but nothing wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to go through, and I'm going to put this at the end of the video. This is going to look backwards to you on three, but, um, uh oh, we have a, a comment. I like comments. Oh, hey. Sherry. Sherry and Outback to basic. Living here. Oh, hey, that's really nice. Hello there, friends who yeah. are friends with Jenna. Jenna. Oh, hey, yes. Jenna. That's awesome. We just met not too long ago. Yeah, they, they got some clothes. I hope everything's going well. I appreciate that. I didn't know you could share this. I'm old, so, you know, <laughs> I don't know how these, the internet works. But anyway, for everybody who's new, we're going to go over this pamphlet, which we wrote. It's kind of backwards to you, I'm supposing. To get anybody who has no experience with these little birds, the information that's necessary to get up and started. And we'll, we'll expand a little bit on some of this stuff, too, as we're talking. Mm -hmm. Things are going, going amazing. amazing. Oh, good. That's Glad great. To hear that. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, they're pretty simple critters. I always mm -hmm. call them like goldfish with feathers because they're contained mm -hmm. in a. Mm -hmm. You got to take care of goldfish. <laughs> but then <laughs> they're fast growing. Okay, so let's start with housing because that's a big issue. Mm -hmm. And we'll that's talk true. about the square footage big needs. Question. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we encourage um, three jumbo quail per square foot. 
So if you have... Um, Wait a minute. People are going to say, isn't that mean? So People these critters, say. these birds, they're smaller. And they... How would you describe? they? If they were scuttling on the ground, like they're not running or flying all over the place or super energetic, they try to blend in and they don't move around terribly much because they don't want to get eaten. That's the thing. They're, that's why you can have them in a small location. They're not... Mm -hmm. They're not out hunting all the time. Their job is to not get killed. So they kind of camouflage and they're pecking around mm -hmm. where they are. And, and that would be for wild types of quail. And these, of course, are domesticated, so they wouldn't be found in the wild. But um, they feel safe and secure in, the, in a smaller space. Yeah. And um, the reason for if you have a hutch style caging, you want to make sure that the roofing, the ceiling, if it's smaller then it has to be two feet or less so you can go like 10 inches up to 24 inches but not above that if it's going to be in a in a hutch style because can i do that sure, sure. Like, sure. we're trying to learn how to feed off of one another here anyway <laughs> yeah. so you don't want it too high because these birds they don't really take to the wing and fly off but they do they do do uh what do you call it jump and they'll mm -hmm. flap up and they'll flap mm -hmm. their wings and when they initially start to flap up, they don't have very much velocity. Mm -hmm. But as they start ascending, their velocity will increase. So if that, that roof is higher and higher, they're going to make impact at a higher and higher speed. And it can uh, yeah, hurt it's them. Yeah, it's a common thing, neck injuries. So yeah, the cage, we, like, we recommend a foot, right? Yeah. Isn't it about like yeah. a foot to 18 inches with something that gives mm -hmm. on top. Hardware cloth. So when they, if they do fly, there's some give to it, and mm -hmm. they don't want to. And they croaked. will, they will jump up. So it's not a matter of a, like, will they or won't they? They will. Yeah. <laughs> and they get excited, or if they get startled, or if a loud sound, or like a dog, something, a predator, raccoon trying to get up at them, they're gonna startle. So mm -hmm. you do want to make sure your roof, your ceiling isn't solid wood if you can. Um, if if making putting a wire isn't an option you could pad it with maybe a foam or if your ceiling is high enough maybe you can add a, a suspended wire ceiling in there so that they do have the yeah gift. and very important thing i know this is a lot of information so take notes or ooh, at the end of this i'll post this mm -hmm. in the comments Another really important thing with your cage, if you're using a, a hutch that's not with the like hardware rabbit. cloth, like a rabbit hutch. you have to make sure it's predator-proofed, okay? Anything outside is going to get eaten up by rats and raccoons, mm -hmm. and they're going to come around. Mm -hmm. And the way we predator-proof stuff is if it's not going to be a solid barrier like wood, we'll use the half-inch uh, hardware cloth mm -hmm. around the cage, wherever the gaps are, mm -hmm. because critters aren't going to reach in there. Yeah, so um, anything, if you have anything that's the size of a quarter of holes, then a mink, a snake, a rat can get through there. Or, or a raccoon. <laughs> rat girl, that's going to get in there no matter what. A raccoon can stick their little hands in there and grab your bird and cause damage. So okay. half inch. Yeah, predator proofing. Make sure the ceiling gives and it's not over a foot or, a foot or 18 inches or so. I mean, you can you work can with it. Even if it's, yeah, if it's 24 inches, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But just make sure you have some give. Uh, and plenty of ventilation. Yeah, that's what I was going to get at. Yeah. Tell them about ventilation. Ventilation is important. Why? <laughs> well, um, birds in general, um, to make sure that they have good um, <clears throat> health, birds in general, they if they get ill, um, you always hear this with chicken coops. They're always talking about make sure there's plenty. There's good ventilation, but not drafts. That's what they were saying with chickens. Um, because poultry, birds in general, are prone to respiratory illness and... Um, proper ventilation in the housing area will make sure they're fine. Um, quail, they do, the jumbo quail, they do run a little hot and um, they, they'll produce a bunch, they'll produce weight, uh, heat. And if they're, if you have, um, let's say you have a standard style hutch, which like mostly half of it is open with wire, the other half is usually like a sheltered area. Um, if you don't have enough ventilation in that sheltered area, then it's just going to get very damp. Yeah, they're the way they respirate a lot. Oh, yeah, here's one. I, I love doing this one for the kids to demonstrate how much fluid comes out of an organism. So, you know, when you tell your kids, make sure you drink lots of water in the summer, and they never do, <laughs> remind them what happens in the winter every time they breathe out. All that you can see 
the condensation of the moisture. And so these birds are doing the same thing just constantly though, because they're hot, they're metabolizing, and the chemical compound they use to metabolize is, you know, water, and they're breathing. So they will produce a very significant amount of fluid, which means also make sure they always have water. So in particular, in the hotter t uh, seasons of the year, um, if they're panting, they're just keeping cool. That's a normal regulating um, technique that they, uh, something that they do instinctual to yeah. cool down. Um, but if, uh, if there's not enough ventilation in that sheltered area, there will actually be condensation dripping from the ceiling. Which will cause so, bacterial growth yeah. and all kinds of other stuff. So it's, that's so, not a big issue as long as it's yeah. ventilated. Yep, just, just plenty of ventilation. And that's, we actually have our sheltered side and we actually have, it's a sandbox and they love the sand. It's, it's just, it makes them happy. Um, and we have a hardware cloth ceiling, so the ventilation is, pro you know, there's plenty of that, but we have a, a, a main overall roof over the whole hutch, so it's protected from the elements. But, um, yeah. Just yeah, that's important. If, once you move them outside and you got your predator proofing and stuff and all that good jazz, you want a roof, shade mm -hmm. and rain and all elements. Mm -hmm. okay. And wind, yep. Yeah. But so, they're very hardy. They're good with the hot temperatures and cold. I think that's about it with the cage. I mean, mm -hmm. if there's any other questions, you guys, just uh, send us a message or, ooh, again, people who dropped in, type questions down there. We can answer them. Mm -hmm. That's about it with the, the hutch, other than make sure that they have access to food and water. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're new to quail, they're not going to overeat like chickens. Chickens will eat until they become a balloon Forged. and explode. Yeah. The quail don't do that. So they're not going to waste food. Yeah, they visit the feeder as needed. Yeah, and if the food isn't there, what happens? They get irritable, grumpy. Yeah, they, get, <laughs> they may start pecking and making more noise. They get a little chattery. Because they're, they're, hey, get away, I'm looking for something, and they become territorial. So make sure they always have food and water, mm -hmm. okay, in the cage. Um, tell them about how they eat with their little snouts, with the waste issue. Yeah, so... Um, they, they peck and um, like pull the food forward naturally just with their, their um, beak. Snout? Oh, with it's their a beak. beak. Yeah, that's right. I'm not good with biology. Um, and it, you, you know, us humans are like, you know, all that food, it's food. All of it is food. There's no need to pick through it because you can eat all of it. You're not like uncovering <laughs> it with a, there's not a leaf over it. There's no rocks. You can eat it all, but they just do it because it's instinctual and they'll just, you know, pick yeah. through. And sometimes there might be a little bit of goodies in there that they prefer over other stuff. So back in the wild, it's, they're instigating insects too, to come out of the earth. Yeah, with they're that just things. So we, um, there's different types of feeders available. Uh, you want to, whatever you have for your um, birds, just think about that so that they're not wasting food. We uh, originally started with um, just regular Tupperware containers um, with like inch, uh, inch uh, size holes around the, the But container. that takes up floor space. With the lid, yeah. Um, but they'll sit on top. But it's a simple solution, um, and yep. you can just put the feed in like a pyramid, and then they'll put their little heads in there and eat it. That's a fun thing, too. Like, you guys, like, especially if you have kids who are involved, they can figure out what kind of feeder to make because there's a bunch of different feeder well. designs. We have J feeders, mm -hmm. which is a box so we that upgraded. sits on the outside, and then there's like a little trough, see it, like a trough that the food yeah, fills, it just in fills in there. And we put hardware cloth on top to keep it. Yeah, their beaks so in. we, yep, so we had. If we didn't have the hardware cloth in there, which is kind of free floating to to move with the grain, uh, they would just keep pulling the grain out. So just yeah. problem solves for what you're using. Okay, go. So we did the uh, lighting. So a question about the winter time, actually lighting and their hardiness. So these are very temperature hardy. Mm -hmm. Santa, yeah, Santa has some. Santa lives in the North Pole. He has <laughs> quails. I talk to him. He, oh. So they do well in the cold. Actually, yeah. they do. So people in Alaska keep them? Right? Yeah, there's people in Alaska, um, and then there's people in Texas and Arizona that have them. Yeah. So, so they lay for us in the heat and the cold. Yeah, you just it just comes down to having proper shelter. If it's very cold and very windy, um, you just want to make sure that they, there's windbreakers uh, and yeah. still they, you want proper ventilation even if it's cold. Um, yeah, because it'll condensate. Because mm -hmm. their bodies are getting hotter to keep warm, and the cold they're eating more food. It's a caloric 
all oh, thermodynamics. I like it. We're doing physics with quails. So they're going to be respirating more in the cold. So you're going to have ventilation even where they are. And they're going to do a little March of the Penguins things where they all kind of stick together yeah. to keep their heat in. Yeah, if it's super cold, they may need a little extra feed, yeah. just like with chickens to increase their production when it's cold. So they're cold hardy. That's not really a big issue to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's very hot, just make sure there's, again, ventilation and shade. So another question, will they, do they stop laying in the winter? Like most birds are going to stop laying when it's the light, mm -hmm. right? You explain because you're smart. Well, it, it affects their hormone levels. It won't stop laying if you add light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you're using them for um, meat or eggs and you're, you know, it's something you rely on um, for food, we do recommend adding lights. Um, it's... There's all sorts of breeds of quail. People do enjoy them for pets. Uh, and sometimes people don't add lights just because they want to, I guess, give them a break. But these guys, you know, everything about them is fast. So they grow fast. They lay eggs really fast. They're ready for meat very, you know, eight to ten weeks. Yeah. Like so if you're not adding lights, then you're losing a substantial amount of production productivity from your birds. Yeah, it's not straining the birds. Yeah. I always tell people there's birds living in the equator. And have, they're laying all year long. So it's not going to strain them. I mean, some people say it may decrease egg laying lifespan, but um, that's not really true. Yeah, they're born, they have the amount of eggs they're going to lay in their lifetime from the start. Yeah. So the, I'm getting back to the whole lighting thing. Mm -hmm. And with the lighting, we use LED strips. And what she was talking about, like, we're strictly, like, we're very focused on food production. Mm -hmm. like, like, people want sometimes get our critters as pets, and that's great. But we're very focused on helping people establish a food program, like mm -hmm. produce eggs, produce them efficiently, and if they want, produce some, you know, meat, because they do make it. That was what a male sounds like, if you heard it. He we have some that we're going to show them to you later. Thank <laughs> God, he took a while. So that little <laughs> crittily the thing. The chartily sound. They do that every once in a while. So, <laughs> He's as like, you can what's tell, going on? Why am I here? He's hanging out. Mm -hmm. So, I lost so with the lighting, um, they need <clears throat> birds, poultry in general, doesn't matter. It, they need 14 to 18 hours of light consistent, consistently throughout the day, every day. <clears throat> so that includes the sunlight. And in the wintertime, there's just the light is less. So you can add a light strip, um, an LED or Christmas lights, as long as you can read a book to it. Um, and um, you put it on a timer so it just kicks on for you in the evening, it turns back off, kicks on for you in the early morning, and then turns back off when the sun comes up. But um, that affects their hormone levels, and uh, the males actually will be affected too. Um, the females, if they don't have enough light, they will stop laying, and the males, if they don't have enough light, they will stop breeding. So that is something to think about too. Uh, anybody who's doing a program where you're growing out your new breeder birds and you're expecting um, eggs because you want to hatch them, um, remember that uh, your grow outs, uh, once they mature, they're going to need to have that amount of light as well um, for at least two weeks to make sure the hens are starting to lay um, consistently and the males are going to breed the hens. If you're specifically wanting fertile eggs, you want to make sure the hens may already be laying the eggs, but the males might not be doing their job. So you want to make sure they're exposed to the right amount of light so that you can anticipate your fertile eggs when you're ready to put them in your incubator. These, do you know what these are for? They're not actually for eating, they're for making little tiny birds, right? So we tend to forget this. So that's why they stop laying when the sun is going down, their hormones in their body, wonderful process of evolution is saying, don't have little baby birds, there's no food because there's no light, you know? It's a really wonderful mechanism. So yeah, they're going to lay when you trick them into thinking that there is uh, it's still green growing and it's still summery. Oh, we have a question from Carrie. What is the oldest age you would breed at? Well, the oldest age for a bird? Oh, yeah. I was going to say um, me. Hello. <laughs> Just um, for a bird, uh, they're still, I think. So the thing is, the males tend to get a little lazy with their job um, faster than the, I think the production for females. Uh, so. We, if you want to have, make sure you, your males are like doing their thing, we do encourage... My Texas buddy, Ryan. What's up, buddy? I sent you an email, by the way. <laughs> we do encourage um, replacing your breeding males 
by about six months or at least anticipate to be ready to. Some males will go just fine to a year and, you know, being active. Some of them are more, you know, have more gusto than others. Yeah. Um, the females, like about a year and a half to two, they're still, they're still giving you eggs. So it's more the males that you have to think about. Before I forget, Brad, I think it was Brad, up a little earlier asked, uh, do you want to scroll geez, let me do the scrolling with my hand on the screen. When do they start laying, oh, when do they slow down the egg laying? Like, mm -hmm. so you get your quail and you have your egg program. So when do the females either slow down or stop? So they start, ours we had for a year and a half and they were still mm -hmm. going. Um, so I would say. Two, Adrian, I'm going to answer your question too. Two years. I would definitely be have your hens ready to replace uh, at two years. Yeah, if you want to keep your production level high, they're not going to stop. They're, they're going to keep you know coming out, but it's not going to be as high. I mean, definitely not as and high. <laughs> they make good sandwiches at that. Yeah, so. yeah. If so. you're if you're wanting them for meat, if you're going to then process your older females for meat, um, I would say a year and a half. You know, retire them to the freezer. Freezer camp. Um, if you're going to, if you anticipate cooking with like a slow cooker or a pressure cooker, two years should be fine as far as meat tenderness goes. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, Adrian asks, can you let the female hatch the chicks on her own? Oh, you know, this is a good question that's because good question. a lot of people have been asking me mm -hmm. that. Now, these little birds, they, people have done this, sure, but uh, it's not a reliable thing. Mm -hmm. Like they, their instincts are kind of dull. Yeah, it's kind of been bred out of, I don't, I don't really know how as reliable they ever were. But, I mean, the wild ones obviously, obviously do. Um, some females, they'll, like, pretend or be interested in sitting on eggs as they're piling around. Uh, but they just get distracted easily and are non-committal. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I get it, because it would be cute to see a damn quail yeah, hatching their babies out. They go through a lot of measures to get them to do it, and some people are successful, but it takes a lot of skill. So if you're wanting to hatch them, if you want to hatch, if you, have, if you want to have a poultry experience of hatching it, I would encourage having your silky chickens hatch them for you. <laughs> okay, here's a good question about the waterers from Andrew. And like this is for the hutch system. So this is going back to the hutch, which is good. So what kind of waterers we use? Yeah, the watering cups. There's a bunch of different methods you can use depending on how many quail you're gonna have. I have a five gallon bucket up on its gravity fed. So a five gallon bucket of water. Feeding. During non-freezing temperatures. Yeah, with a hose system leading into PVC pipes with the little cups attached. Mm -hmm. So we have like three, just three cups in the mm -hmm. big quail cages that house 70, 75 quail or so. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. So we do use the uh, the watering cups. It's, it has there are, like the little tongue thing that the quail, they bump it and then it drips water into the cup. So there's not like cup, uh, water always filled in the cup. So it just keeps it cleaner and yeah I've cleaner. seen people use the nipple systems mm -hmm. and, and they do that they'll they naturally will see the drip and they'll they'll drink it really quick chicks will pick that up really yes quick but like you are correct in the winter it would be a solid rock so in the winter we use um ugh, I go out there and I empty ice from these Tupperware containers with the little holes drilled in it so they can stick their heads in so we have in the winter, um, they're you like can, Tupperware boxes. I have several holes drilled in, but yeah. You know. Some of some of our hutches, we don't have um, heating elements in the water, but we have um, we just use aquarium heaters um, in our waters, uh, and that helps prevent it from freezing. There's also a different type of bird bath mm -hmm. uh, heaters that are ceramics, and they are the weighted, which is nice. They don't end up floating or moving. Um, and there are regulators as well that you can plug heaters into that that will kick will turn the heater on once it senses the outdoor temperature is getting close to freezing. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And Carrie was asking about the tenderness of meat. So mm -hmm. at said about meat tenderness and age. So do they get mm -hmm. tough as they get older? I mean, all animals do. Yeah. At, but so it's not when they're much. young, like if you're doing a meat program, they're mm -hmm. going to be tender because you're raising them out to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. At eight to ten weeks, you're butchering these things yeah. and they're ready to go into a meat program. At two years, if you're calling a bird and want to cook it, it'll be a little tougher. So, you know, that's...
uh, culinary skill at that point, you're going to slow cook it or mm -hmm. like I throw them in a pressure cooker and the thing is just like, like pulled pork. It falls mm -hmm. right off. In 30 minutes, it's yeah. delicious. <laughs> so the tenderness issue, if you're not using... Yeah, that's If you're just cooking over fire, burn. yes, like over a grill, yeah. yeah. But if you're cooking it in a saute or something, it'll 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 definitely get soft enough but to yeah. be tender. If you're doing a meat program, you're gonna want to um, yeah process your birds at about eight weeks. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna be using a lot of extra feed, and it's just not economical. Okay, so. let's go. Since we're talking about growth, I want to talk about the feed. Oh wait, I'm gonna do my. Uh, Thing I keep reminding people, type a question yeah. in like these good folks. If you have any more questions, I'll ask them. So what do we feed? So I get a lot of questions about what do you feed these birds? So if you guys are brand new, and that's really what this is for is just if you have no knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we actually have two stages of feeding, like their, mm -hmm. their young juvenile stage and well, then they're when they're, yeah, and once they're transitioned into adulthood. And mm -hmm. what do they eat as babies? So, so um, while they're growing from hatch day old chicks um, up to 10 weeks old, they do stop finish, they're finished growing at uh, 10 weeks old. Um, we do say process at eight weeks for meat because it's only like two to three ounces <clears throat> extra you're getting at 10 weeks old. So it's, it's up to you how long you want to grow them. It's just an but, economics thing. So they have two more weeks of feeding versus yeah. two ounces. It's... That's it's up to you. <laughs> so, uh, but they're still growing mm -hmm. until 10 weeks and you don't want to stunt their growth. So we feed, uh, recommend feeding a higher protein, like a game bird feed, 30% protein feed. And that'll um, be written, some of the people don't have any experience. It'll be written on the bag. Yeah, right on the front. 30% protein. And it's game bird. And then we'll even say game bird. And... Yeah. And, uh, and <clears throat> then you can... <clears throat> switch them over to a layer chicken layer feed um like a crumble layer 16 to 17 percent protein it needs to be lower um, you do layer feed because now you're focusing on just maintaining their health and then also um there's a calcium in there for the hens to lay what's the percentage their, uh, three, three about 3.5 percent calcium for the stronger egg laying muscles and to thicken to make the shells Thicker. Well, that's not something you're going to worry about. Like, layer feeds are pretty much standard at that 3.5%. Yeah. Just for your knowledge, mm -hmm. you're going to want to incorporate the calcium for, what, their muscles and yeah, the, egg the -laying shell. Muscles. It, so the egg-laying muscles, because uh, if their muscles are weak, they can prolapse when they lay eggs, and that's really painful. <laughs> um, so, but not common. It's just, it's proper dietary nutrition for the bird. Now we do recommend at six weeks old that you start the transition to from the high protein, 30% to the lower protein. So six weeks old, start mixing the, the layer feed into your high protein so that it, as they age, it's, they can just switch right over. It's not, so you can, um, you can get these feeds at your standard box stores, but we do recommend going, um, checking out for a, a local mill, a feed mill near you, or even seeing if, if you don't have any near you, call around and see if anybody delivers. Yeah, especially if you guys, some people are doing like community kind of things where they're working with multiple families. And, you know, you have your project of chickens, maybe goats. And if you're doing quail, go to the feed mill and buy a few hundred pounds of the feed mm -hmm. to have store stocked it. and store it. It's a lot yeah. cheaper from the feed mills. It is cheaper. We were looking at the prices, and um, we work with our local feed mill, Ross's Feed Mill in Quarryville, PA. And um, for at Tractor Supply, for one um, game bird, 30% uh, retail bird feed, cost. it's 40 pound bag is what is what they had. And it was like, um, it's... Uh, it's like twenty five dollars with you know rounding it, yeah. um, and our feed our feed mill. It's just a standard you know plain bag that they put it in, uh, but it's a fifty pound bag and it's about eighteen dollars and fifty cents um, for bag. Now they usually like to do larger um, batches, but it's definitely worth it. You're skipping the middleman. You're working with your your local community, and they care about you, so they're gonna give you a good product. Yeah. Ooh, our lovely friend Stephanie from over in Frederick. Hi, hon. How are you? Thanks for chatting with me the other day. Hope I didn't sound too impassioned. <laughs> I have deep philosophy, I follow. Um, so she's asking, how loud are the males? You know, if you rewind about 10 minutes, mm -hmm. 
We have a male. You gotta here. find it. But the male went off. We have some birds in here. They're not loud at all. So they sound like a wild bird. Gosh, it's like it's, a shatter. Yeah, it's much quieter than a chicken crowing. Oh my god, yeah, it's a lot quieter. Yeah, than you can crowing. like chickens. You can hear your neighbor's chicken. You know, several houses down the road going. They're about as disturbing as in the springtime when you hear the little Tweety bird going outside. I mean, they're they're game birds. They make a very small sound. And they don't do it frequently, like mm -hmm. do it often. So when I go outside and we have hundreds of these birds, I don't, I don't even hear them. Like sometimes they'll make their cricket noises, but it's hard to hear them. So if, if you have the proper male to female ratio, and we encourage five females to one male, then the males are busy. If you're growing out um, a pen full of males, males. only, and then, they don't have females, mm -hmm. they don't have anything to do. So they will, they will get chattery and louder because they, all they can yeah. do is compete with their call. So that yeah, is so, something to consider. Yeah, if you're doing a meat program with males, you're gonna have sound. They're gonna be but they, la, 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 la. they start, they they're mature they start getting mature at six weeks old and you're going to process them at eight weeks old so they really won't be chattering for long yeah um, i think there's a couple things a couple yeah questions. Like, was there was there one come on, see more i'm trying to hit see more well let me see more your hands are scrawny oh there yeah. we go andrew so you're asking oh by the way we're on the phone so <laughs> when we come up and jam our faces in there is there a taste difference between fertilized and non-fertilized eggs? It's a good question, because I've heard that a lot. Mm -hmm. Is there any advantage to keeping males if the goal is egg production? Good question. Can yeah. I answer one of them? Yeah, sure. I'm going to answer the, is there advantage to keeping males if the goal is egg production? You don't need males for eggs. They're going to lay just as many eggs. You do need males if you want to hatch the eggs. They need mm -hmm. to fertilize them. If you want to replace your own birds yeah, instead of buy any in the future you can always introduce males later like if you're like ooh, you know i think i want to reproduce my quail you can then bring in a male mm -hmm. but yeah you don't need a male at all if you just want eggs so is there a taste difference between a fertile or infertile egg no there is no taste difference um so really there's i mean there's not, not even there's a minute tiny uh detail visually if it's like you can see it in a chicken egg it doesn't matter any poultry. There's no taste difference. Um, if you if you crack the egg open, which you, again you can see it easier in a chicken egg because it's bigger. Uh, there will be you'll, you look at the yolk and there'll be like a white dot in the yolk and um, you know it's fertile if you see like it looks like something went through the dot. That would have been the sperm going through the dot. It would then it's fertile, but there's still no taste difference if it's fertile. The only um, thing is there's nothing happens no development happens in the egg unless you put it in a warm area and it stays in this warm area so then development can potentially start but likely will cease because it's not consistent yeah. so let's say it's a hot summer day and you have them on your counter uh, or hot summer two weeks and you have them on your hot kitchen counter for two mm. weeks then what you might see is if you crack it open and it's fertile you might see like a blood spot or something like that and it means it it was warm enough to activate but not warm enough to stay developing and it stops good question and actually <laughs> remind me of something for people who are totally new to these animals birds or poultry in general especially egg making how long can the eggs stay in the fridge? They don't need to stay in the fridge. So when these birds are laying eggs, you can keep them out for, you know, weeks and weeks, really. Mm -hmm. They can yeah. stay out for quite a long time. So there's a, what they call bloom, I guess, mm -hmm. that when the bird lays the egg, it's, it's a sealant. It keeps, it allows the eggs to breathe, but it keeps bacteria from deteriorating or compromising the egg's integrity, but it'll keep it safe out on the counter, the bacteria aren't gonna compromise it. Mm -hmm. However, like if there's a crack or if they're getting old, they do expire the air or the water, right? The moisture yeah, can evaporate through the egg. Because eggs are porous. Yeah, so you may see some, like it'll look a little empty in the air sac, it'll look a little worn. It's because maybe it was sitting there for weeks and mm -hmm. some of the moisture had gotten out of the egg, but the eggs are fine. You don't have to refrigerate them, and if you're just raising a few, you're probably going to eat them well before mm -hmm. 
they would ever go bad. And the bloom stays on as long as the egg is not washed. If yeah. you if you wash it with water, if you rinse it with water, the bloom comes off and it needs to go in the refrigerator. Goes in the fridge. Now, if you do decide, let's say you don't wash them, but you do put them in the refrigerator, if they at any point go into the refrigerator, you want to keep them stored keep in, the, in fridge the fridge because if you take them out, they're going to sweat because <laughs> of the temperature change and then that will compromise the bloom. So you decide if you want to store them out of the fridge or in the fridge. Very interesting stuff. Mother mm. Nature, I love Mother Nature. Like So yeah, the bloom will keep them healthy and safe on the counter. Just don't wash them, but... There might be a couple questions or comments. Yeah, always Callahan asked me if I went to eat my <laughs> Oh, cake. well that's fine. I don't know if there was Oh, was anything. there a taste difference? No, we did that. No, that was it. Oh, Brad asked about the difference. Do we feed them crumble? Do they have to eat crumble or can they eat mash feed? Mm. Um, mash. I'm not too familiar. Well, we feed them uh, crumble. So we they do like crumble. They don't really like pellet. It's bigger. If it's too dusty, they they don't they're not crazy about dust. Um, they will eat. They will consume the food. Um, yeah, he's eating. So they have a mash because it's a lot of it seems dustier. Mm -hmm. So they're eating that mashed up. Yeah, food. and if you do get it from a um, a mill, by the way. They can uh, grind it. they can grind it per your preference. They can grind it larger or smaller. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're feeding chicks, they can grind it smaller for you or mm -hmm. larger for your adult birds. Yeah, but they're definitely not going to eat big grains. Like pellets. Yeah. The adult yeah. quails. So, yeah. okay, good. What's the other important thing in here? Oh, bumblefoot. I want to talk about bumblefoot. That's something you're going to hear if you're new to birds. You're going to hear this... What's bumblefoot? So bumblefoot is just a colloquial term, I suppose, for an infection that birds get when they get a cut on their foot. So they're mobilating all day and they may get a cut on their foot. So do the quails, how do you prevent bumblefoot and the quail? The, the main way they're getting these infections is by cutting their feet on the flooring, right? On the hardware cloth. So if you have hardware cloth on, a, on your cage, you want to sand it down or use a coated cloth? Like a light, you don't have to like, you know, strong arm it with the sanding. Just a, a light, um, even sanding, just Ooh. to get any burrs out. Anybody who's not builder savvy, hardware cloth is not cloth. It's, <laughs> I forgot to mention at the beginning. It's such a weird joke. It's, it's a steel grating. It's like a half inch by half inch, just wire pattern that uses a flooring and a hutch. Kind of like chicken wires, that octagon pattern. Hardware cloth is that a series of little mm -hmm. squares. Okay, I want to see important stuff. I'm reading out of here because I'm trying to figure out. To get to get to get, okay, this is a question we get commonly. Are they allowed to stay where I live? Am I? Is there an ordinance against them? Most areas aren't regulating. These are non-native um, mm -hmm. game birds. A lot of places are regulating uh, the North American endemic species like. The what, California quail, mm, the Bob, whites. Bob whites, and some variants of those. You're going to see um, regulation on them because you don't want them being introduced into the wild species. Different yeah, different areas. Uh, uh, one question we do get with uh, food is, can I feed my quail kitchen scraps like I do my chickens? Um, and is that a supplement for their feed? Um, uh, you can give them some yummy goody snacks if you wish. That's fine, uh, but they do need to have uh, their their proper nutritional diet uh, available to them at all times because they do have a fast metabolism, and you want to make sure they're getting the amount of food that they need each day. And the scraps of food may that from the, the we eat may not give them what they need. And if they don't have you know the proper nutritional mm -hmm. diet per day then it doesn't take long for them to lose weight because they do have a fast metabolism. But again, they don't overeat. They do eat what they need. So. Yep. Okay, finally we're going to do something fun. I forgot about the birds. <laughs> we're going to show you, because people say, what's the difference between male and female? At three weeks old, these birds will develop a pattern, these wild colored, their pattern's called wild uh, or pharaoh. Coternix quail will have a pattern which will allow you to identify whether it's male or female at three weeks. Female speckly. And the male will have a broad, reddish, or orangish colored chest. Is that bird going crazy? Oh, I'm just repositioning him. Like We're going to show you the bird's orange chest. So that's a male. So this is a boy. See his nice rust red chest? You can also see his cheeks are like a darker brown. 
And I'll show you the difference in the yeah. female. Well, here, let me hold up the noise. female so we can compare. Do you want to hold him? Yeah, go ahead. I don't want him flopping off. Just hold him. I got him. Gentle. I got him. I got him. I got him. <laughs> yeah. So he's a good size. How old is he? Uh, he is 10 weeks old. Here's a female. And uh, she is also, let's see, I don't know where you got her from. But, top um, cage, top little cage. So she's, uh, she is older than 10 weeks. <laughs> you see her speckles? That is how you know she's a female. And her, her cheeks are a lighter brown. She also complains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, kidding. she's nice and full because she's um, very nice and uh, yeah. mature. So she, they're pretty birds. I mean, I think they're pretty, especially if we only have a few. We have millions of these things, so we don't appreciate their appearance as much. Yeah. But they're, I mean, they're pretty birds. You can hear him making some cute sounds. Yeah, but they're they're pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. This is usually what their disposition is. Yeah, they just mill about doing their thing. So. All right, no, oh, see, I want to pet them. I like to pet everything. <laughs> so that's your male and female. Yeah. I didn't want them going crazy on me. So I gripped them. I wanted to share their whole body, but I didn't want them flapping. He usually anymore. goes. <laughs> Be gentle. So, do they play like chickens do? Um. They like yeah, the they, they like do. The they, they they get a little excited. Um, they'll flap their wings. Um, in with their feet still on the ground, they'll flap their wings. And but I guess they're because they aren't chickens, their behavior would be different. Um, but they do definitely interact with each other. They're social creatures. Um, they chatter and talk to each other. Um, yeah, and people ask like, well, can I keep? A, can they be good pets? And yeah, I mean, if you're going to spend time with these animals, they'll acclimate to mm -hmm. you. Yeah, people people will put them on their shoulders and hold them. Yeah, they can be good pets. They're mm -hmm. you know, birds aren't stupid animals, but every animal like you know, if you don't spend time with it, it's not going to be tame, docile, or used to, to you. To humans, yeah. Which brings up the stressor issue. You know, I forgot to mention this too. Like one of the things that affects. Uh, all birds really is like stressors, predators, and potential threats. So if you have these quail, a lot of time people ask us, why my quail or why my chicken stop laying? And there's a bunch of reasons, but one of the things you may not realize is a stressor, something that's wigging the birds out. Maybe you got a skunk or something scooting around at night and he's not eating anybody, but he's scaring them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they're not going to lay. Again, Kind of for the same reason with the winter thing. There's no reason to be making babies. First of all, they're having a hormone reaction. But also, uh, evolutionarily, you're not going to be putting energy into making babies when it's an unsafe environment. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever that may be. And stressors are usually other animals. Maybe you have a cat in the house or something. Or loud noises. But they will acclimate mm -hmm. to, other, to these stressors. Like if you have an animal a pet, a cat, or something that's coming around all the time. Mm -hmm. It may or scare your, them. Your family dog running around the yard all the time. Like, they get used to, they'll get used to it. Yeah, and then they'll continue to lay. But if mm -hmm. you introduce a new stressor, or you notice they stop laying... You might have a raccoon on top of their cage trying to get yeah. at them. It's pretty scary. <laughs> so that's something to be aware of. I think we went over most of the good, important how-to stuff. And I hope yeah. this... Is there anything else we're missing that was really important about this? Quail, because they're pretty easy. There's not too much involved in getting these guys oh, ready. Man. Oh, cool. Stephanie said. Let's see if I can touch it. Yeah, there I got go. big fat fingers. <laughs> I, miss. I may have missed if you said it earlier, but how about how, how many ounces is each bird after processing? I read that quail is pretty filling. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, they do have a lot of. We didn't mention this earlier. Front. Yeah, so after processing, so let's see. Uh, a jumbo quail is considered a jumbo if it's 10 ounces or more. Um, ours are what? 10 weeks. What are it's, we ours doing? are between 12 and 15 ounces. And we do, um, it's, it's good to keep, if you're breeding them, it's good to keep them just under 16 ounces as your max point because then it's like, it becomes like those large dog breeds. Big dog syndrome. Bad hips. Up, bad hips. Breathing. The legs, the organs will fail. They take up smoking. They, they don't live as long. So it's best for them, you know, to be under that if you're breeding them. So if you're, if you have like, if, if it's a live weight, 12 ounces, it's probably going to be about two, two ounces less cleaned. 
Oh gosh, you know, I never even married uh, weighed the clears after processing. 10 ounces says, after or before processing. So, so that's before process, a live bird to be considered jumbo. That's by like the minimum size would be 10 ounces. Like you yeah. want a bird that's going to be 12, get, 14, 15 ounces. But just the technical yeah. standards. But if somebody's selling birds or showing birds and they say this is a jumbo, they have to be at least 10 ounces just to qualify mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. But that's a minimum. So you probably want bigger for a food program. Yeah. They want a small, if they're pets, yeah, 10 ounces, who cares? But if you want it for a food program, a little bit bigger bird's going to yeah, be Yeah, they'll likely better. be 13, so 14 ounces. The answer to Stephanie's question, how much do they weigh after they're processed? I, I don't know. Let me be honest with you. I think you. it's I two don't know off the top of my head. Less. I never know. Yeah. But they are filling. You're right. The, uh, the, the breast meat is nice and full. And <clears> for <throat> if you're eating, um, eating it on a dish with like a side of rice or whatever, a salad, some vegetables on your plate, then for an adult male, would you say two, one and a half to two? For me, one and a half is yeah, plenty. One, I don't one, even eat the eggs or the legs. I mean, it depends. Like, like yeah, like one is. I think one is enough. I'm a glutton, so I eat a lot. I'm still one growing. One and a half is plenty. My doctor says I'm still growing and I should eat a lot, but <laughs> like one and a half is more than enough for a meal. Yeah, and if you're just eating meat, then you know you just figure out how much you're gonna eat. So mine aren't jumbos, but they weigh about five to six ounces after processing. Okay. Yeah. I guess it depends on where you're starting. You said they're so they're tiny. standard size, so yeah. they're a little probably smaller. About half the size or a little bit. By the way, I have a, a horrific processing video on <laughs> our Facebook page that shows you how. If you haven't seen that, if you're wondering how do you process the birds, I know Stephanie. I may have talked to you about this, uh, whatever, yesterday, the day before. They're really, really easy to process. It only takes a minute or two per bird. Once you know how to do it, you just snip, clean, skin. I skin them. You can pluck them if you want, but I don't do that because I'm processing 50 of these things at a time, maybe 60, and I don't really use the skin. Like I cook everything so I know what I want, and I'm just gonna be using the protein. It's a high quality lean protein. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the skin's good. If you do but... pluck them, the, the feathers come right off yeah. without struggle. You could pluck them by hand or get one of those little, it's like a coffee can with. Their skin is a little thinner. Little fingers in there that than the peels chickens. it. Yeah. 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 You want, if you're going to be plucking a lot of them, if you want to do that, like, you know, there's people who do this and sell them to restaurants and they pluck all the birds because they want to have the skin on. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing it at home and you want to pluck a lot, you want to get a plucker. They're cheap, they're just little canisters that they roll around in and it plucks the feathers off. But they're just for quail. I bought frozen from my local Asian market to compare, and they weighed three ounces each. I thought that was crazy. Wow. Yeah. Sounds like they were not yeah. jumbos. <laughs> yeah. Three it's... ounces. Wow, that's small. Yeah. I'm... The thing is, not everybody can raise farm animals, but everybody practically can raise these little critters. Yeah. You know, with a cage. It, and it depends on the who you're getting your birds from, you know, what their breeding standards are, if yeah. they are keeping to the the standard of perfection for the breed, um, if they care to have um, healthy animals and, you know, like we value quality and not everyone does. So that is wise to, if you're purchasing birds, to um, think about where you're getting them from. Yeah, if you're out of town, do the vetting process, you know, find out who you're dealing with, their, the product that they produced, because it's the day and age of idiots. Like, you get online and everybody's selling subpar stuff, they don't know what they're talking about, and the consumer doesn't know. You know, it's the job of the person who's selling whatever it is they're selling to articulate and educate the consumer what they're purchasing. That's why we do this, all right? We want you guys to know facts about these little critters or at least spark some interest in this to do the investigation yourself too and gain more education and you know know what you're dealing with so. but if those are three ounces then they were likely standard size quail which are not jumbo and they were probably young that's what my guess would be probably could have been anything yeah. i mean i shall not speculate on the bag of quails <laughs> And I don't have enough, I'm a scientist. Not enough data. I have a science background. I don't have enough data to make any concrete yeah. statements on the quails. This would yeah. be mere speculation. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, but if you have any more questions or comments, let us know. Yeah. Oh, let me do my cheap sales pitch. If you had fun with this one, come join us over at the YouTube. 
We got a ton of good stuff over there. I just put a channel up there because uh, I did a TikTok video. I don't know if you guys saw it. I'm not into the TikTok. I'm old. I hate this stuff. But a friend of mine said do it. Yeah, all the video stimulation was very overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, and then everybody under the sun started watching this video and asking mm -hmm. about quails. And if you are one of those guys, we've been doing these education videos for a while now. So this was just something new. So I started a YouTube channel that we're going to do probably a little more in depth and more succinct. So it's not a rambling hour and a half of information. I like to present stuff when I'm doing this in the video. I have time to edit stuff. Give you a ton of information as quickly as possible. Nobody has a attention span or time. So you want to get information quick. Just while they're making it. They're making, they're making, they're making, they sound like, what's the, the... Gizmo? Gremlins. Hippos? <laughs> I don't know. The communication. Oh, words, Morse code. They sound like Morse code. Yeah. They're just tapping. They're making, um, like, tappy noises. I don't know if you guys are picking that up, but this is very quiet and cute. <laughs> it's like they're having a talk. It's very yeah, quiet. Chattering to each other. Anyway. Yeah, so check us out the old YouTube. Uh... Use this Facebook. It's a pretty quality resource of information that we put on here. And like I said, there's a butchering video in the in our post feed. If you want to search for that, it's in there. And if you have any questions, just message me. You know, send a message to us. Yeah. Or uh, give a call. I'll be happy to talk with you. I've been educating lots of people. I say that all the time. Morse code. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right. You know, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> And I guess I'm going to go out and finish my dinosaur hunting. That's why I'm always dressed like this. We have a <laughs> lesser raptor problem. And oh, feel Carrie, free to no post problem. comments after the fact. Oh, after. Carrie, he's over in New York. He's the guy you met oh. at the place, right? Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. Hi, Gary. Yes, I remember. I didn't meet you. I'm the husband <laughs> yes, guy. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gary's a nice neighbor from across the river. I actually think we do battle. I think it's your county versus uh, Lancaster County because we're. I, th I think he's he's actually down in Maryland. Oh, okay. Um, Toby said thanks. Oh, yeah, but if you have questions hunt. after the fact, please post them or comments because we'll see them and later we'll we can um, answer your questions later as well. Toby, I meant to call you back because you got a whole bunch of new stuff <laughs> to chit chat with you. I've just been busy again. Oh, hey, Shannon. <laughs> Thank you guys, Thanks. Angela. You have perfect eyebrows. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. Make me blush. <laughs> I married this lady. She's a very nice woman. We love her. <laughs> anyway. Thanks Thank guys so much for stopping in. Oh, hey, Shannon. I love your silky videos and um, pictures that you post of the silky ladies. They're so cute. <laughs> I never but, saw. Oh. Oh, you know, you have to we're friends me. on the Facebook. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Man. Nobody wants to be my friend. I understand. That's all right. I get it. <laughs> Just well, kidding. Thanks so all much, right, guys. you guys. Yeah, we'll see you in the next one. If you have any questions, like I said, send them over. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any ideas for a video you want to see, let me know. We could talk about whatever you need to talk about. I know everybody wants to hear about incubating and hatching and all that stuff. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're going to go do house stuff and I'm going to clean. Bye. See you.